Hello everyone, I'm Heidi Hanna and I am super excited to bring you the next edition of our Stress Talk Live broadcast. Uh, once again, I'm here with Dr. Srini Perlay and uh, I'm going to have him actually spend a couple of moments just sharing a bit of his background before we get into our topic for today. So good morning, Srini. Is it still morning there for you in Boston? It is. And okay. I actually have to look at the time to just make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is it morning? I'm not sure. Well, welcome. And, you know, we've had a chance to get to know each other over the, the past couple of years, and I, I find your work absolutely fascinating. But, but for those who may be new to you, could you tell us a little bit about your journey and what you're currently working on? Sure. Um, so, actually, this is one of the questions that stresses me out because it's going to take the whole time, but I'll try to summarize it. Okay. So, um, I'm an MD. I went to medical school in South Africa. I did a, a fellowship in neurochemistry in South Africa, and then came to the US where I did a residency in psychiatry at Harvard, um, and then did a fellowship in structural brain imaging, um, and then a fellowship in psychopharmacology, and a fellowship in uh, functional brain imaging. And then I directed the anxiety disorder service at an outpatient service at McLean Hospital, which is Harvard's uh, largest psychiatric inpatient hospital. Um, and Partly through that work in the anxiety service, actually, in my outpatient practice, there were a lot of people who didn't want medications and they didn't want therapy. So I learned executive coaching mm. and then became a certified master coach, uh, where I then uh, combined my experience in brain imaging research. I, I did brain imaging research in a lab at Harvard for 17 years. Uh, and I was the director of the Panic Disorders Research Program there, where we started to look at things within panic and even beyond panic. And really started to get to understand what was happening in terms of brain circuitry. And uh, I didn't listen to my mentors at the time, who told me I had to decide whether I was, I was a clinician or a researcher. So I just held two jobs simultaneously. And partly it just came to the fun of loving both of those things. And the advantage of that was that I found myself subsequently in a place where I could combine the insights from brain science and the insights from, from clinical uh, psychiatry to be able to help people you know, use different frameworks to manage some of their personal problems. And so since then, I've, uh, sort of aside from my clinical work, I'm an assistant uh, professor part-time at Harvard Medical School now. I've moved from my full-time position to part-time. Um, and I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. So I, I, I do a bunch of different things. I uh, work in the self-help and, and sort of psychological health fields as Dr. Srini Pillay. And then I also work with corporations of uh, helping them do a couple of different things. Uh, firstly, with leadership development and organizational learning. Uh, so I deliver programs to a large number of clients. Uh, like some of the people I can mention are some Fortune 100 consulting companies. Uh, I work with, uh, in, in the not nonprofit sector, people like the World Bank and the um, IMF and the United Nations. And then in the for-profit sector, uh, some food and Fortune 500 food and beverage companies, um, Lockheed Martin, um, Prudential, so a bunch of different companies. And it's really awesome because I get to think about human behavior from a number of different perspectives and, and then integrate that with brain science. But the two things that are common across all those different domains are human psychology and brain science. And so that's the way I try to make sense of that. Uh, I do do a lot of other things as well. I, I actually work in uh, biotechnology consulting. So I work with investment companies, helping them understand drugs across medicine, from heart disease to stroke to a bunch of other illnesses, to try to understand which of these medicines is going to work later or not. I've been doing that for the past 10 years. Um, I'm also a musician, a poet. Uh, so I, I really try to mix it up and enjoy my life. But it sounds absurd, but with every single thing that I do, I try to mix it in with human, even in my music, with human psychology and with brain science. Yeah. Life uh, as an exploration then as like a mm. declaration. Um, and is that what stresses you out about the question is that there are so many things that interest you that it's hard to really put that and narrow it into kind of a box that we're used to? Yeah. I yeah. think that, and also because, you know, like a lot of people are like, well, what are you doing? You know, are you, like, are you just dabbling in these different things? But that's partly what inspired my new book, Tinker, Dabble, Doodle, Try. Yeah. Uh, after Life Unlocked, which was really, and if I write as well, which was really about using ideas about brain science and human psychology to overcome fear, 
mm-hmm. in a number of different dimensions. I decided that, that Tinker was really a great book to write because I think that there's a lot of value if you can jump into a field with depth and then make connections. You know, for example, I've just designed a program for organizations combining uh, principles of music with principles of brain science and leadership development in order to help people develop teams more effectively. Wow. So, you know, it's not quite as um, disparate as it sounds. And I think in Tinker, one of the things I pointed out was that there were people sort of, you know, who had made amazing discoveries. I mean, Picasso and Einstein were both people who dabbled in the mathematical theories of Poincare. And as a result of that, Einstein extended Poincare's theories two more steps and developed the theory of, 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 of relativity. And Picasso actually developed his whole sort of cubist painting angle from contemplating the fourth dimension through Poincare's mathematical theories. Mm-hmm. And although, you know, these are big names and these are big concepts, the truth is, I think in everyday life, we miss out on the opportunity of combining our insights from cooking with raising kids and how to be with friends. You know, like mix it up, just see what happens. You know, there's, there's a lot of competencies you can learn across fields if you're doing it with some kind of sense of purpose, I think. I'm always so grateful for our conversation. Sometimes I feel like you have, been, you're like an angel who has been sent to me to help me deal with the demons of the day. And it's so timely because I feel like in today's world, and I think a lot of people watching will relate to this, there's this competition for kind of knowledge and information. And now we have access to more than we could ever really utilize in our lifetime. And the real magic comes when we can integrate those concepts or take existing pieces and, and nudge them in just a simple direction that makes them more applicable to people. And yet I find myself really battling that, that sometimes, um, thinking about this concept of, of integrative neuroscience or even even when we're looking at stress management. Um, so, so for this particular topic, how do you see stress playing a role in all of that? So you're, you're involved in all of these different dimensions and these different avenues, and you've written books on the topic of unlocking ourselves from fear. Um, how, how common is stress nowadays? And, and I guess, what role do you see it playing in hindering our ability to fully integrate concepts and kind of shift from insight to or information into insight? I, I think, it, uh, firstly, I think it's pretty common as a phenomenon. I think what's important, and I think the reason we're having these discussions is that I don't think we're gonna be able to change the stresses themselves on our own. Right. But what we can change is how people respond to those stresses. Right. The fact that we actually do have a choice in how we meet any stress, whether it's not having enough money or relationship stress or holiday stress, we do have a choice in how we actually sort of manage those stresses. So to answer the first question, I think it's pretty common. I think, um, you know, in terms of how it factors into what we do and how it hinders what we do, fear, which, is, which often accompanies stress. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as we pointed out many times, I, I think in our conversations, there's a good kind of stress called you stress, which is really helpful. And you actually want that kind of stress to mm-hmm. motivate you. Uh, and then there's this bad kind of stress, which can lead to all kinds of diseases, really get in your way. When fear accompanies stress, you can get these fight or flight responses or actually just freeze. And so if you're busy fighting something rather than living your life, or if you're flying away from it rather than living your life, or if you're frozen in it rather than living your life, then it gets in your way. And I think part of this paradoxically really comes from overthinking. Mm. Uh, It's really like we've come to rely so much on rational thought that we see it as the be all and end all of yes. life. But one of the reasons I think you and I thought to have this talk on blueprints is that it's not just how you figure something out, but it's also how you picture your life. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, your, your goals don't always have to be a series of sentences. They can sometimes be an integrated picture, which may not make sense to anybody else, but you, you build a picture and then you tinker with it. You know, yeah. it's like what I said earlier, sort of like what well, you might say, well, you know, what is he doing? Is he trying to just do five million things at the same time? Sometimes that's the case. But a lot of times it's, well, you know, I, I love music and I love the brain and I love human psychology. And I'm so grateful that all of these things can come together to serve people. 
you know, deliberate service, I'm a little iffy about. I feel there's so much talk about service. I feel like it pressures all of the people I see mm. from the CB. They're like, I want to be of service. And I'm like, oh my God, you're stressing me out. Oh, you're funny. stressing yourself out. Isn't there some way that you can really enjoy your life and then enjoy the fact that your enjoyment leads to serving others? And, and don't you think in some, uh, to some extent, service is also it's become so big. It's almost like we have to live like we're dying in every moment and it's gotta be huge. And it's like this reality TV show phenomenon as opposed to serving through simple acts and, and very simple exchanges with people. Sometimes the magnitude of all of it is leading to that pressure where I feel like we, we do freeze and we, we don't make you know even the simplest progress in some of those things because I love service and so I'm all for it. But I do think that sometimes we overthink service and we make it bigger than it needs to be and that's where we can get stuck yeah i mean i i think my my personal preference is a two-way relationship i mean yeah. I, I think yeah. i love service but i also love being served mm. and i think um i like transcending the service being served paradigm into a place where there's just a spontaneous exchange of energy and it's not like what am i doing for you and tit for tat yes. i find that tedious yes I'd rather just transcend it and just and trust it and learn to trust it over time. Yeah. There's a reason we call it the service industry, right? It's like, wait a minute, I'm serving you and I'm part of an industry or... <laughs> you know, like, well, isn't that where some of our compassion fatigue comes in too? Because if you're in a service industry and you're constantly giving energy out and you're not truly being fed by that or served back in some capacity, then we end up just totally burning out. It happens so often. Yeah, there's so much guilt, I think. Guilt is such a big factor here because yeah. everybody feels like they have to meet some kind of state of perfection or they've got to do everything. They've got to be the perfect everything. Spouse, and partner, and friend, and you know, person at work, employee, leader. It's like, well, I'm not saying lower your standards. That's, that's the other piece I don't want to get into. Like, I feel like there's a big movement which is like, don't worry, you can lower your standards. And I said that because I'm an expert. It's like, no, don't lower your standards. If anything, raise them. Because studies show that there's an inverse correlation between burnout and engagement. Mm -hmm. So the more, the more engaged you are, the less burnt out you'd be. Right. You just have to figure out how to get engaged with your life. It's like someone I saw yesterday in my practice who's this brilliant guy who like hates business plans and hates math and just doesn't want to do any of it. And so I had a family meeting the other day, and, and the father was like, well, you know, he doesn't want to take any initiative to do this. And he was like, I don't know how to do it. Mm. I'm just not smart enough to do it. And I said, listen, you are smart enough to do this. Let's think about it together. And then he was like, you know what, you're right. Maybe I'll hire someone to do that. Why don't I get someone to do the pro forma? Because I don't want to do it. Right. And then, and then I'll oversee the process. And I was like, yeah, now you're finding your brilliance. Yeah. You're engaged because no one's forcing you to do the math that you don't really want to do. Right. So, so why do you have to do that? So I feel like people stop short. I actually feel like we've been sold. I don't want to get totally off topic on this, yeah. but I feel, like no, I, like it. I, yeah. I, I feel like we've been sold a bill of goods on education. Like mm -hmm. I love the education I've had. And I think for me, it's been an incredible sort of journey in being able to organize my thought. Mm -hmm. But I've never for once thought that the that I get my intelligence from education or my dumbness from it. Like I feel like my intelligence and my dumbness are sort of part of who I am and I engage education in that way. I think a lot of people who don't go to school or don't have advanced degrees or they're always like, well, you know, I'm not a smart person. Well, no, that's really not true. Like, yeah. I can't tell you how many brilliant people I've met who yesterday, again, I, I worked with this guy who was just unbelievable, you know, high school education, education, electrician, honestly, one of the smartest people I've ever encountered. And it was funny because you know the way it came out? It came out, he used to hate himself and hate his body. And he would be in this thing because he was sort of you know, a nice guy, sort of overweight, like barbecuing, hanging out with his family. That was his whole deal. Uh -huh. And I was like, okay, I know there's something cool about that, but like, you're like a super smart guy. Like, isn't there a way to be all of those things to the extent that you want to be them? And he recently started running marathons. And I saw this look in his eye, and he was so competitive. And I was like, see, this thing you got in you, this fire that's being lit in you, you found it in the marathon. And I'm just going to say to you that whatever that is, I'm not going to sit here dictating what it should or shouldn't be. 
but pay attention to it. Because I really believe that there's a fire in every single person in the world. And yeah. the question is, how do you bring this fire into some kind of image mm -hmm. that you can then play with and tinker with to let your brain do what it needs to do? Because let's face it, nobody wants to work that hard at this stuff. Like, right. I'm kind of slogging away at things. I like it when I'm lost in things and I work hard for a long period of time, and then it doesn't even feel like work. Mm -hmm. But if it's drudgery, like, I don't want to do it. I don't think anybody does. So I feel like it behooves people like us to work with other people and say, let's try to figure out how you can do the stuff you need to do for your brain, but in order to decrease the effort so you can use your innate intelligence to get to your goal. Mm -hmm. And I think that brings us to today's topic, which is really how do we create that framework? How do we work a little bit to put something into place that then is going to allow us to get into that flow state? And I know, I mean, just yesterday even, I was having a conversation about this, and as soon as I lose a sense of purpose, I get so overwhelmed. And it's amazing to me how purpose and, and faith that is all going to work out, and as you mentioned, kind of that picture of what we want our life to be without it being a set point, because I don't feel like we necessarily need a destination, but we need some sort of framework or blueprint for our brain to then be able to move us through automatic processing so we're not having to struggle so much. So you've mentioned these three steps that I find really fascinating, and I'm curious to see how we go about creating a rhythm with these and not necessarily a logical sequential order, but how do we flow through these three different states of mindfulness, mind wandering, and visualization? So could you maybe start by just telling us what each one of those are? Because I think they're terms we've heard of, but maybe don't have real clarity around what exactly they mean. Yeah. So, so mindfulness is essentially ignoring this constant mental chatter in your head, which is really your brain just randomly creating narratives. Like we believe, if you listen to every narrative your brain created, your brain is just like a random electricity generator. It's yeah. just constantly telling you stories and habitual stories. So mindfulness is saying, you know what? I've had enough of your randomness. I'm just going to pay attention to my breath, take the attentional flashlight, my inner attention, place it on my breath, and whatever goes on in the narrative, I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore it. If you get pulled back into it, you gently bring your attention back to your breath and you practice this for about 20 minutes a day and that's a great start. Now, if you're thinking, oh my God, I don't even have five minutes, yeah. start with five minutes. You know? And if you want to do one minute every hour, do one minute every, just do some kind of mindfulness practice that will get you used to it. Mm -hmm. Mind wandering is, there, there are two kinds. Again, there's constructive and then there's not so constructive. The not so constructive is when you slip into daydreaming. That's really not that helpful. Or when you're constantly wandering into guilty or dysphoric or depressive daydreaming, that's not that helpful. Yeah. But when you have positive constructive daydreaming, when you set aside 15 minutes in your day simply to daydream, what you're doing is you're taking your perception. I mean, think of how much time we spend when we're awake we spend most of our waking hours looking outside and hearing things coming. We rarely go in and look at this delicious thing that we have called a brain. Like, it's like, when was the last time you really tasted your brain? Like, just mm. go in and say, okay, let me just sit down and wander. I'm going to set 15 minutes aside. Let's see what's in my brain. It's unbelievable how little attention we pay to what's inside of us. So mind, mind, so mind wandering is really about, I'm just going to let my mind... I'm going to go and look inside myself, see where my mind is going, let it do its own thing. Basically like taking your mind out for a walk the way you would take your dog out for a walk. And so just to clarify, so mindfulness is bringing your attention to something other than the thoughts that you're having. So bringing your attention to your breath and being in that kind of still space of right. trying to really not let your mind wander, but you notice it and with no judgment, you, you let it go and you come back to the breath. So it's that grounding in breath or counting or mantra or something that's not pulling you in a direction and then mind wandering um, is paying attention to what's being said, but allowing yourself to just watch the dialogue or be aware of it. Um, also, it sounds like with non-judgmental attachment, but one's just paying attention to not thinking and the other one is paying attention to what the thoughts are saying. Yeah, I, I think in, in, mind, in, in mindfulness, you're allowing your narrative to carry on, but you're fixing your attention on your breath. Mm -hmm. In mind wandering, 
you're letting your attention wander and you're letting it wander to wherever it feels like going. And if you set aside 15 minutes and you find, studies show that it's best to mind wander if you're doing some kind of low level activity like knitting or gardening mm -hmm. or playing some kind of you know, video game that doesn't involve a lot of cognitive activity, that if you do that, it's much better than no activity or high level of engagement. So yeah. it's the low level of activity like knitting or just you know, playing around with something. And I would say there are other studies that show that just the only thing that matters is taking time out to mind wander, setting a limit on when you're going to stop. You could put an alarm on and just say mm -hmm. at 15 minutes, I'm going to come out of it and then just daydream. And it does take practice. It sounds easy, but it's not that easy. It, it doesn't is sound easy. To me, it sounds a little terrifying. It's like, oh my gosh, where's my mind going to go? And so it makes me wonder if there's any sort of course correction, because you mentioned, you know, you don't want it to be depressing or negative or guilt or shame or some of the things that we can ruminate in. So if you were to find your mind going there, would you consciously then shift it to something else that's more playful or enjoyable? I think what I would do is observe it rather than engage it. Mm -hmm. So um, in that state, rather than shift it, I think I would just sort of, in general, there's, there's some interesting things. Firstly, your mind usually wanders in the direction you want it to. It's something that you haven't thought of. Like if you want something deeply mm -hmm. and you register that deeply, your mind will go towards it if you let it go. It's a little bit like a sniffing dog. It'll be like, hmm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to see, I'm going to see what's happening there. You know, sort of suddenly you find someone or something in your life and you're like, how did I end up with that? And you're like, well, because my mind wandered there mm. and I let it wander there. And then it discovered something. So I think that mind want, that you can trust that your mind is, and if you find something you don't like, you know, look at it, observe it, and you can move away from it gently. I think with visualization, what's cool about it is that it literally is creating a mental movie. So uh -huh. you know, some of the links that we'll have associated with this include some, um, like a written more extensive description of how you can make a mental movie. And we now know from athletes, for example, mm -hmm. who use this kind of visualization and from people who've had strokes, that if you strongly imagine moving a region when you have a stroke, you're more likely to be able to move that region. And it even gets better if you have computer feedback so you can see what's happening to your brain waves as you're imagining. And when you see that, you actually are able, I mean, it's kind of amazing that you can't move by simply imagining, you actually stimulate the action center in the brain. So the supplementary motor cortex, this kind of secondary action center, mm -hmm. and so it warms up the action brain. And so every time you imagine something, you're warming up your action brain. And eventually, it's all this information is getting fed to a navigator in your brain. That's like, hmm, information. So what does she want now? She wants someone who's great to live with. Great. They're like, mm, what does she want now? She wants someone who looks like that. Who wants that. The more you collect information, the more you give it to your navigator, the more your attention is going to settle where it needs to settle. Right. Otherwise, you're distracted. And so we now know things like when you're imagining, if you want to imagine effectively biologically, the very first thing is to de-stress because stress turns off vital regions in your brain where images come up. Mm -hmm. So even if you, if you want to create a picture, stress will turn it off. So I always tell people, start with mindfulness. So right. start by de-stressing yourself for five minutes. When you're in that space, just start to create the picture in your head. Now, let's take a concrete example. Let's say you want to make $200,000 this year. And you're saying, right now I make 60, I want to get to 200,000. I don't know how to get there. Well, imagine yourself in some state that would be an end result so you can give your brain an image as a guide of where you want to go. Mm. Well, you see yourself maybe on a yacht in the Mediterranean and you're like, it probably costs much more than $200,000. But let's say, let's say you managed to get on a yacht like that because you had the money to take you there and you met someone. So you go to... You go to your mind, you're like, okay, I see myself on the yacht. The first thing to ask yourself is, there's two things here. One is, let's say you try to build the image and you're like, I can't really, it's just too unrealistic. Given the fact that I've got three kids and I've got, you know, a spouse to take care of and I've got shopping and I've got my job, like there's no yacht in my future. 
It's like, I just, and then you feel really insecure. And you're like, oh my God, I feel insecure. What am I going to do? Well, there are two types of imagery that you can use that are especially helpful. So when we study images, the five overall types of image are the one where you hold up a trophy because you, you've won. Mm -hmm. Then there's the one where you come from behind. So you're imagining, okay, I'm at 60,000, 80,000, 100,000, 130,000, 150,000, 200,000. And you imagine coming from behind. Then there's a type of imagery where you're super relaxed, one of your favorites, and a massage table. Yes. Or, or where you're super activated, where you're jazzed. You're like, oh my God, this is awesome. And then there's a type of image that's called cognitive specific, which is like the serve in tennis, like the one thing that you're not going to do, like, you know, filling out a balance sheet or writing the business plan. And then there's the kind of imagery which is external. It's like the way football teams draw up strategy. They're like, okay, let's make it, a, you know, a, a whole, this is a diagram of the, of, of the field. This is where we're going to start. And we're going to go here to here to here. So you're imagining outside of yourself. Well, studies show that two of those kinds of images are the most helpful when it comes to confidence. The first is coming from behind. Mm -hmm. so, so you draw a little graph. You're like, okay, January, 60,000. February, 80,000. And you watch this graph go up. And so eventually you see, wow, I've overtaken whatever this goal is. Coming from behind is really helpful. The other is cognitive specific. You know, like one of the things I hate doing is business plans. I cannot stand it because they mean almost nothing to me. I feel like I've seen so many business plans fail. Yeah. But by the same token, that is one area where I'm weak. So for me, one cognitive specific action is I have to sit down and I'm going to write a business plan because I've just avoided it for the last couple of years because it just, it annoys me. And I feel like everything's changing all the time. Yeah. So my plans can never keep up with anything. But, but that's one cognitive specific action. And I think in tennis, for example, sometimes my serve is completely off. So if you just imagine serving, it actually improves your confidence. So mm -hmm. those two types coming from behind and this specific kind of imagery can also help increase your confidence. So the first thing we said is when you're creating a mental image, be mindful. Mm -hmm. so it'll decrease your stress. Secondly, come from behind and think of something specific. Thirdly, if you're still freaked out, it's probably because you've imagined in the first person. Like you're on the yacht, but you're not looking at yourself on the yacht. Mm. You're looking at the ocean around you. You're looking at this amazing person who's in your life. Everything that's freaking you out. That's imagining in the first place. It does stimulate your brain very strongly in many studies. But you can just as easily stimulate your brain with third-person imagery where you're actually looking at yourself from above. So when you look at yourself from above, what you're actually doing is, is using imagery in the third person, and that can be really helpful. And then the other piece is believability and compatibility. If you can't even imagine 200,000, don't even go there. Just yeah. go to like 80,000. And it's got to be believable. And whatever you're imagining has to be compatible with who you are. And as soon as it's believable and compatible, and then we have strong, so you want the image to be clear, mm -hmm. but you also want the image to be multimodal. It's not just you, it's you smelling the ocean, maybe a little bit of the, of the sunblock, and you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, this is great. And you can hear us, you can smell something coming from the grill that's on the boat. And you're, you're also feeling this cool wind in your skin. And you, know, you get yourself into this thing and you can see all of a sudden you're like, whoa, like, where am I? That's when you know you've hit the spot. Mm -hmm. So if you follow each of those things, de-stressing, coming from behind, uh, the specific image, you know, if, you, if you make sure that it's in the first person and the third person, if you then make sure that it's believable and compatible and that it's strong and multimodal, these are the things that build a beautiful brain-based movie. And so you'll see in some of the links that we've provided, you actually have some of these steps outlined for you. But what I would recommend people do is start today, mm -hmm. start, practice five minutes of mindfulness, pay attention to your breath, then in another part of the day, just allow your mind to wander. But after, directly after the mindfulness, write down each of these categories of the image and draw your image of a goal that you'd like. And practice this once a week to start. Set aside 15 minutes to refine this image. And if you can't think of something, get an image from, from online and then keep on modifying it until you're like, wait a minute, this is the image that I really, really want. 
And the reason this works is that your brain in having this blueprint is going to now try to find what it needs to find and go in the direction it needs to go because it's got a navigational, it's, its navigator has a picture of what you want. It's mm-hmm. not that magical mood. It's like, my brain knows what I want. So the navigator now has important information. You know, if you start going towards the east, it's like, no, 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 Mediterranean. You know, if you start like going on this perfect ski vacation, it's like, no, 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 yacht. You know, and so it keeps on correcting. And the moment it starts correcting, you're now on a journey towards your goal. And that's why images are so powerful. And that's why athletes use this with such great precision to improve their run times, to improve their strokes, to improve swimming, diving. Each of these things has been shown that imagery can improve your performance in all of those different sports. Yeah, wonderful. Well, what I hear you suggesting uh, that I think makes a lot of sense for this is dedicating some time, carving out some time and space to weekly kind of create the movie. So really be clear about what it is that you want and spend a little extra time. It makes me think of vision boards or other sorts of visual tools that we can use that also then become these kind of non-conscious cues to shift us in that direction. So if you're a creative person, you could do a collage or take some photographs of places that you want to see just to kind of help enhance enhance that experience. And then on a daily basis, spend time watching the movie. So you're actually kind of directing and producing the movie once a week and maybe 15 to 20 minutes. What does that look like? Maybe on a Sunday or a Monday. And then every day spending some time getting into that framework where you're watching the experience, watching yourself um, in all of those dimensions, having that experience so that your brain really knows the direction to take you in. And then um, just one last thing with the kind of mind wandering and other topics that we've discussed around kind of tinkering and scheduling some time throughout the day to not be so focused and not be so intentional. And I'm curious, and I can look at the research a little bit too, but earlier on you mentioned like knitting or gardening. Um, I'm just curious if sometimes some sort of physical activity um, can also get us into that state where we can mind wander more effectively. Because I know even when I'm running or working out, I can let my mind go and I don't get freaked out. But if I'm like sitting on a couch there's something strange about it where I find myself going in directions that aren't as comfortable. So maybe it's a neurochemical balance that allows us to have more positive endorphins. I don't know what that is, or even time in nature where it seems like that would kind of enhance the mind wandering experience and, and nudge it in a more positive direction. Yeah. Physical activity is great. I mean, for de-stressing, it's fantastic. Well, the studies show that if you walk non-linearly, you're more, you're more likely to increase your creativity. So instead of walking down the straight path, if you're on a hike and you're like, hmm, let me go this way, and then you go this way and that way. If you want to be more creative, that's probably that, that mm-hmm. called embodied cognition. But that movement gets translated into a thought process that allows you to make stronger connections. Physically, I think, I think exercise does help you de-stress. And I think, number two, walking in this kind of zigzag way can be much more helpful. Also, studies show things like you, if you make a zigzag with your, with your hands versus if you just follow finger loop, you're less creative. It's the finger loops that actually help wow. you become more creative. So movement is a huge part of this. And we can actually sort of maybe set one of our agendas in the future on, on yeah. movement and why movement is so critical for de-stressing and the different ways in which we can move in order to de-stress. Thank you so much for your insight in all of this. And uh, for those of you who are watching as part of Stress Talk Live, we have more topics, as always happens. They evolve naturally out of our conversation. So I would love uh, personally to start the new year talking a little bit more about movement and physical activity because I feel like, especially in the new year, people are looking to <clears throat> get fitter or maybe you know try running a 5K or doing some sort of physical challenge. And it would be fun to talk about, you know, from a brain perspective, how do we Um, get to that point. A lot of people struggle to create new habits, but then also, on the other hand, how do those um, 
tasks or how do those activities actually help our brain? It's, it's such a mutually beneficial relationship. And then the other one too, kind of selfishly that I'm curious to talk more about is teams. You know, I'm starting to do more with teams and you mentioned the same thing in businesses. How do we instill some of these blueprinting rituals within teams and organizations to help them to create a mental movie that's all going to move them in an optimal direction? I think sometimes there's a collective um, visualization and then an individual visualization that has to kind of play into that. So some fun dynamics and how do we produce kind of the optimal mental movies. I love that. And so for sake of time, unfortunately, we're going to have to call it a day for today, but um, we will be back again very soon in the new year and I'll, I'll give a list of topics um, and show times and we are going to get a chance to connect in person here in a couple of days. Uh, and who knows, maybe we'll even do a, a Facebook live pop in at that time. So I want to thank everybody for showing up and anything, any words of wisdom you want to leave us with today, Srini? I think just have a fantastic holiday. Just enjoy the new year and think of it, use it as a leverage point into something that you want your life to be. And know that there are people like us who are around who are really interested in sharing what we understand and being with you on this journey. And you know, Heidi, I'm always so grateful to be with you on this journey. Yeah. Of in being with people in, you know, in a real way. I, I just think there's so much that we can learn from others uh, and that we can share with them as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Take care.